Coming up on Theater Talk. My family... They would have been Reagan voters, probably. No, right? no, 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 no. They would have been Democrats because they were working class. Yeah. They knew better than to vote for Republicans when they were working class. You have to be crazy. When were you radicalized? Is this a political show? <laughs> yeah, no, I thought radical. this was Theater Talk. <laughs> theater Talk is made possible in part by the CUNY TV Foundation. New York City, this is Theater Talk. I'm Susan Haskins. And I'm Michael Riedel of the New York Post. So, Michael, we have one of my heroes of <laughs> broadcasting. Fluttering her up business. already. Already. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> Joy Behar, who many people know from The View, but she's had a remarkable career in many a media. But now she's got a one woman show at the Cherry Lane Theater. It's called, appropriately enough, Me, My Mouth, and I. Right. How long did it take you to come up with that title? Well, you know, it's, it's really. Success and also failures are about my mouth. I get fired, I'm hired, all sorts of things happen around my because mouth. Of mouth. So <laughs> when were you fired? Oh, you have to come and see the show. Several times. <laughs> Several times. WABC, we were talking about that before right. we went yes, on the yes. air. I was fired from WABC. Why? Because of something you said or just Who knows? Or I can't give it away because oh, it's right. in the show. In the show, are you talk about the very first time you were ever fired and did you think that's it, I'm done, over, finished. Well, no, the show has a lot to do with uh, my growth. I started my career when I was 40. Mm -hmm. So I had a whole life before that. Mm -hmm. I was born in, in an Italian neighborhood. I, I was a teacher. I worked at a mental hospital, which I always say prepared me for The View. Yes, I would say. I, I was an employment counselor. I did a million jobs. I had a child. I had a husband. I traveled to, I lived in different states. A whole life before then. And then things happened. Things changed. A lot of things came up. Came down on me, mm -hmm. and I changed my life, mm -hmm. and that's what the show's about. Basically. Were you always interested in a showbiz career, though, growing yes. up? Yes, well, like an actress, right? Yes, I think I was basically programmed for showbiz. From too. your parents? The whole family. Did you have a Mama Rose type mother? No, no, my mother was not the the culprit. It was the whole family. <laughs> and where do they have you get up at parties and yes, everything? Yes, I was the little Miss Miss uh, Shirley, Miss Shirley and Temple. What, what would you do? I would sing and dance and do whatever they wanted me to do. I was like a little trained monkey. You said your mother wasn't. Who was wanted? The my train? aunts and uncles. They wanted a trained monkey. They wanted entertainment. I was the TV set. Did you study acting anywhere though? Or? I tried. I studied. I did. And in my later years, I, I studied at the HB Studios. I went to the American uh, the American Academy. Academy of Theater, what you call it, where Marlon Brando went? Yeah, yeah. dramatic arts. The dramatic yeah. arts. Yeah. But then what gave you the the moxie that when you were 40, you, you said, I'm It wasn't just moxie. It was a series of things, a couple of tragic events, a series of things happening to me that made me say, you know what? This is it, kid. You better do it now. Are you divulging the, uh, the tragic event, or is that uh, waiting for the show to... Well, it's not tragic. I mean, it's look, let me tell you something, Susan. Okay. It's a funny show. Even the tragedy is <laughs> <I'm> funny. funny. <laughs> I'm not from the tragic school. <laughs> I tell this story to all my friends because people say... I said to my friend, one of my girlfriends, Taffy, who watches this show, so oh. I want her to... She's got a Hello, show. Hello, Taffy. Taffy. Hello, she, Taffy. She's a stand-up comedian now at an advanced age. She's very good. Oh, good for her. So anyway, uh, I said to her, you know, what am I doing? Who cares about my story, really? I said, that we have friends who have... Their parents were turned out to be gay. They got beaten up. Uh, they, 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 they took drugs. But, but, but that's a story. Mm -hmm. And she said, yeah, but where are the laughs? <laughs> <laughs> so that encouraged me to do my show because there are many laughs. Mm -hmm. Many. And there's video, there's slides, there's photographs, there's stuff. I want to just go back to the question I asked you. You remember the very first time you were fired, though? <clears throat> In my life? Yeah. Um, I would say I was fired from a teaching job. They just didn't renew my contract. Oh, so it wasn't was, a dramatic kind of a... Well, it was kind of... I mean, I wanted to stay there, but they, they let me go because uh, basically it was during the Vietnam War, and I was telling kids not to go. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and they found out about it, and they didn't like that, so... Oh, that's... So you were always political then from oh, the very... Oh, yeah, of course. Did you, you grow know? up in a real hardcore no, lefty household? No, no, They're Italian. How lefty could they be? <laughs> <laughs> the Italians are not that lefty. <laughs> Oh, no, true. they're a pretty conservative group. A very patriotic group, you know, conservative, left, right wingers. Not right wing. Right. I had, you know, but they, my family. They would have been Reagan voters, probably. No, right? no, 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 no. They would have been Democrats because they were working class. Yeah. They knew better than to vote for Republicans when they were working class. You have to be crazy. <laughs> when were you radicalized, though? Yeah. Am I right? I, I know. I don't, where, 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 why do we have this country full of crazy people? Right? I don't know. They, you know what? what Gore Vidal used to call this country the United States of amnesia. 
Yes. <laughs> and I think that's what happened this time, too. They just forget. Right. They forget. When, when were you radicalized? Is this a political show? Yeah, no, I thought this was theater talk. <laughs> no, but I mean, part of your part of your 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 story is you're outspoken yeah, yeah. on a lot of the political. Well, issues. I always say nobody in my family ever told me to shut up. I came from an Italian family. I was the queen. Talk, say whatever you want, type of thing, and I took them seriously. Mm -hmm. So sometimes you get in trouble for that. Sometimes you don't, and I I, I like it. So that's a child rearing tip, really. I, I think that you yeah. know that whole thing. Children should be seen and not heard is a bunch of baloney. You let children talk. My grandson, he says whatever he wants. Now, I, I'm just going to quickly fast forward to The View. I, I was talking to you before that I, when I read you were a teacher, yeah. I thought, well, isn't that interesting? Because in a way, she had the role of a teacher in The View that she came in every morning. She was ready to go. You were there 17 years? 16. 16 yeah. years. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's quite guess, a stretch. Yeah. yeah, it's quite a stretch. And, then, and I'm sure, you know, the paycheck was okay. So that, that was right. a motive. And it was in New York. It was in I New had York. to work in New York. That was one of my things. But hmm. still, what, weren't there times when you just thought, oh my God, I, I can't. I can't do this. I can't do this. Well, of course. You don't have that once in a while, don't you? Are you kidding? We barely me? even speak to each other <laughs> yeah, when we're yeah. not on no, camera. No, barely, yeah. yeah. No, I mean, of course, any job, you wake up and you say, why am I doing right, this? You know, right. Why was I born? Why am I living? Right. So, you know, you, you do say that every job, I think. But you always would read about these, you see, these very aggressive show business types brought together. And then I always thought, well, how does that work really? You know, well, not on, on camera, but how does it work? I yeah. think that you have, it's the yin and the yang. I mean, some people are uh, aggressive and some people are not. Mm -hmm. Some people are uh, analyzed and some people are not. Well, there you go. So, and okay. so, you know, it becomes like, you know, uh, my, my philosophy has always been, so what, who cares? I mean, I'm interested in my mental health and my physical health, so nobody's going to drive me to distraction. Mm -hmm. I won't allow it. Mm -hmm. So other people maybe get crazier than I did. And you've come brilliantly yeah. uh, to, to a one-woman show, so there's nobody around to bother you or get in your way. It's exactly. all about you. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, it took me a while to even get to the point where I would think of doing a one-person show mm -hmm. because I've been doing stand-up for years, yeah, 30 sure. years, more than 30 years now. This is a little different. It's mm -hmm. just as funny, I think, I hope, but it also has a storyline, and it has pictures and things, like I said. I, so it's a whole, it's really a, it's a play. It's more like a play, though. It's kind of a play. Now, are you directing... This yourself, essentially? Or yeah, is, yeah. Yes, you are. So you're moment. really working with At the moment. At the moment. At the you're moment. working with nobody. Uh, no. <laughs> no, my husband's producing it. Ah. I'm co-producing it with someone. We have, there's a whole group of people. There are people doing slides. There's a whole, I have actual people in the theater who work. <laughs> but you're in charge. Well, it, it's on me, right? It's on you. I'm right. out there. I'm the one. Yeah. That's is right. this Could something we, you wanted to do for a long time? I was doing other stuff. When I was on television, obviously, I had two shows a day yeah, yeah. Uh, for, for three years. Yeah. So that was a lot. And then I would do stand-up sometimes, too. Mm -hmm. So then all that sort of ended. And I had a whole year of relaxation last year, because I left a year ago. That's right. That's I right. was like, I couldn't believe that, how enjoyable that is to have all this free time. But then why are you going back in? I know. Well, I do like to have things to do also. Yeah. So I did this. Well, now, I just want to ask you, you are over 50, let's say. Thank you, Susan. And you look, <laughs> I should hope so. You look, right. My daughter's 43. <laughs> I hope I'm over 50. You look fantastic. <laughs> you're, you're full of energy. Yeah. What's, your biggest, what's your biggest health tip? I don't know. I don't know. It's you genetic. Know. Genetic, okay. It's genetic. I don't know. I, I have a lot of energy, and I, um, and I enjoy life. I don't want to die, ever. Yeah, right, right, right. Like our friend Joan Rivers said. Oh, my God. That's so tragic. I still can't get over it. Yeah. Well, you were pretty close to her, I would imagine. I was very friends. friendly with her. Yeah, we were friends. She was really funny. You know, I mean, she was the role model for women comedians. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. This is yeah. the woman who started it. She and Phyllis Diller, and there was a couple of others. Uh, Jean Carroll back in the day. I don't know if you know who she was. And there were women comedians along the and way. And Minnie but Pearl, who had the... Hat with yeah, her. I never could relate to her. She was too country for me. <laughs> like, what? Italian girl from New York. <laughs> Take the price tag. But off she was hat. funny. I, I got that she was funny. Yeah. It was like Red Skelton. I didn't get him either. I never got him. No. No. I was, I was, you know, I was like, I liked Clem uh, Cadiddlehopper. No, right. <laughs> You're like, what? Before we go, I do want to ask something that you touched on when you found out uh, you were no longer on, you weren't on television. You had a year for free. Yeah. And you enjoyed it. I did. Because I know there's some people who. For them, the microphone of the camera is a kind of addiction. And yeah, it's no. very difficult. No, no, no. I don't energy. live on TV, Michael. <laughs> Unlike you, apparently. <laughs> you and the radio also. You live in, you live in the media. Yeah, well, yeah. You know, I mean, I'm not 
as established, I must say, as you are. But what, so what, what would happen if you were not on television or on the radio? Or not have a column as I have in the newspaper. Yeah, you have a lot of outlets for your rage, <laughs> for your Republican Not rage. enough of them. <laughs> you know, I would like to think, but I, of course I don't know, but I would like to think that, like you, you know, it was a great run and then it's not there, but there are other things to do with one's life. There are many things to do. Watercolors. <laughs> There's things. There are things to do. And well, it must be nice when you don't have to read a book for someone uh, you're going to be interviewing the next Well, you don't do that anyway. <laughs> <laughs> he wings it. He wings it. Yeah, I do. Well, you know, the thing about that is that I always had to be on top of everything, so yeah. you couldn't watch TV without calculating what am I going to say about this. Yeah. I mean, I would have to be now on top of all of these annoying elections that just took place, yeah. you know? <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Well, we get to find out more about your, your, your life and your career and its ups and downs in uh, Me, My Mouth, and I, Joy Behar's new one-woman show at the Cherry Lane Theater, uh, running now as this is airing, right? Started November yes. 6th, yes. going to yes. December 21st only, uh, and only four shows a week. That's uh, it. Whoa. Limited run, baby. <laughs> so run to the well, theater and, now. And then are you... Are you going to go off and do a film or something? No, I, I just, I didn't want to kill it. myself. Okay. What happens if it takes off and they want you to 50-city well, 50, 50 tour and... Oi. <laughs> <laughs> no, like I said, I enjoyed the year of uh, doing nothing. <laughs> All right, well, it was a great pleasure having you on here to talk. Nice to meet you, too. I get a job at uh, Good Morning America as a receptionist. <laughs> And I was the worst, let me tell you something about that. I was the worst receptionist in the history of Good Morning America. I was the worst receptionist. People would call me at 7 o'clock in the morning. I'm on the, the, the switchboard. Good Morning America, Good Morning America, Good Morning America, Good Morning America. They call me from Canada and they say like, uh, where's Joan London? I say, how the hell do I know? <laughs> Hello. I'm sorry. Who's that? Um, it's for me. Michael. What? Michael. <laughs> on a, how's this for a title? On a stool at the end of the bar. I've had some experience in the air <laughs> <laughs> over oh. my time, I must say. But it is, uh, it is a fine new title for a play that, frankly, we, ha we know nothing about, but it's written by a good friend of ours, Mr. Robert Kaleli, Bob Kaleli, as we like to call him. Uh, Bob has been in the theater business for many, many years. He ran the uh, HB Studios for, uh, for Uta Hagen, uh, and now he has decided to put himself out there as a playwright. Now, you are a lawyer. No, 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 oh, no, no. You're a producer, producer. He ran the American Theater Wing. Ran the American Theater, theater, theater Wing, all those the Theater Development yeah. Fund. But were you always secretly a playwright underneath it all? <sighs> Well, I'll tell you uh, just a very quick story. When I was at the University of Wyoming in the, back in the third century, I had a very tough English teacher my sophomore year, and all the football players liked to take her because she loved football, and she passed them all to keep them eligible. <laughs> and I didn't want to take her class, but I had to. It was the only option available for this time period. So I sat way up in the back, and all these football players were down here. And at the end of the semester, we had to pass in our papers, and she came into class, and she was mean cookie. And so she was going through and giving them paper, and she said, Bob Kaleli, Mr. Kaleli. And I started to get up, and she slammed the paper down on the table. She said, I'll see you after class. <laughs> Scary. And so everybody left, and she picked up the paper, and I walked down tentatively, and she said, Mr. Kaleli, I don't know what to do about you. She said, you tell the best stories, but you have the worst grammar. <laughs> so I'm giving you an F for grammar and an A-plus for content and a C for the course. <laughs> I only heard the F. Uh, I didn't hear you tell the best stories for 30 years. It was so painful, yeah. that F, it, that big red F on the paper, that's the only thing I saw. I never saw anything positive about it. And years later, when I started writing, uh, I thought, I remembered her, Dr. Winslow, Annie Winslow. I remembered her, and I thought, oh, my God. You missed. You tell the best stories. You can learn grammar, but something about stories that they kind of come out of the ether. Oh, yeah. As this play sort of came out of the ether. Well, give us a sense of what this play is. I know it's got a uh, twist in it, so you don't oh, want to give it away, but give it's us got a, a sense. Huge, of... It's got a huge twist. But it's a, it's a Jersey, a it's a family in western New Jersey over Cherry Hill, Camden County kind of thing. And uh, Tony Owens, a lumberyard, he's sort of a upper blue collar, young Robert De Niro type. And he's in a relationship with a woman he's been with for 10 years who's helped him raise his, uh, his three kids, now young teenagers, by his first wife who died of drugs and overdose. And 10 years into this relationship, though she would never marry him, 
some horrible, deep, dark secret falls out of the past that just shatters everybody. Oh, that sounds good. When you were running HP Studios, were you writing plays then too? Yes. Were you showing them to Uda and... Uh... Well, I gotta tell you something. This play is the second of a, of a trilogy that I call my stories from the 1980s. And the first play involved somebody was stricken with polio and it's quite whatever. And I never, I started writing, but I just never, because I'd produced and all that, but I never believed in myself as a writer. Mm. I came from a troubled background, so it just, I didn't have a lot of confidence and, and so it's kind of been a struggle. I just would put them on the shelf. <laughs> and one day somebody said to me, who knew I was writing, are you ever going to let me read one of your effing plays? <laughs> and asked me several times. So finally, I, I took it in the office one day, and I thought, well, if they, if they ask again, I'll let him read it. And he did. And that night, I got a phone call saying, I cannot believe you've written this. What have you done with this? <laughs> and he wanted to do a reading of it. And he put together, it wasn't this play, it was another play. And he put together a reading with Nancy Marchand wow. and a oh, whole best. wonderful cast. And I was just a nervous wreck. I'd never been through anything like this before. And I let them talk me into inviting 100 people to the, see this reading. Oh. And he said, you sit over here and you don't pay any attention to anybody that's over here. So I was the only one over here. And so the play starts and Nancy and the cast, they just had a couple of days rehearsal, a, you know. And suddenly there was this burst of laughter back here. And I turned because I thought somebody had come in late and dropped it, that they were laughing at something that happened back here and I wondered what it was. And I turned and nobody was doing anything back there. And then at the same time as I turned back around, there's another burst of laughter, and I realized they were laughing at wow. what was going on on the stage. And I sat down like this and said, oh my God, I wrote this. You wrote that. I couldn't believe it. And so that was a really changing moment in my life. And, but I didn't believe in it well enough to try to do To go any farther than the reading. So then I wrote this play, and the exact same thing happened with another friend of mine that said, are you going to let me read anything? And I let him read this play, and he said, I've got to do it. He ran a theater out in San Diego, and he said, I've just got to do a reading of it. So I flew out to L.A. for Christmas, and I went down to see a reading of the play down there, and it was a real rough kind of go. But it really was quite an amazing experience. So then when I went to work at HB, I began to do readings and things like this. And we did a big reading of it down at HB 12 years ago. Oh, so this has been quite a while. Yes. Yeah. And... The next day, my phone rang, and it was a Tony winning, Tony Award winning Broadway producer that wanted to do this play. <laughs> I made a couple of bad choices, of which I had to live with the consequence, and uh, it didn't happen. Mm. I decided to go with somebody else who also wanted to do it, and uh, that person never got it off the ground, and the other producer would never speak to me again about it. Uh, the heartbreak of the theater. The heartbreak of the theater, and suddenly, 10 years went by, and Michael Parva, Mm -hmm. who's directed it. Who had come down to see that reading 12 years ago with the same producer, ran into me on the street maybe 10 years ago and said, what's happened to your play? That wonderful play. And I said, well, blah, blah, blah. And I told him about the bad choices I'd made and living with the consequences. He said, oh, well, could I do it? <laughs> well, nobody else is. Anyway, he called me last October and I was getting ready to go to London for an extended period of time. And Michael said, Bob, what's happening to your play? I want to do your play, it's time, we just got to do it, it's, we, we just got to do it. And I said, well, thank you, Michael, yes. I said, do you have the money? <laughs> yeah, minor, minor detail. Minor detail, <laughs> the same minor detail before. And uh, there was this silence, and he said, uh, well, uh, we've got some of it, actually, we're kind of hoping you'd help us with all of yeah. your experience. And, <laughs> and so I'd been- Don't down, put your own money in I the did, show. I know, I know. <laughs> Well, I got caught by Mr. Madoff, so I don't have a lot of money to put up anymore. Yes, oh. But anyway, I put down the telephone, and uh, I just wasn't going to think anything more about it, you know, because I'd been down this road for the, with this play for 10 or 12 years, and my assistant was at work, Tom Rhodes. He's a young singer and actor and uh, works for me. And he said to me, uh, what was that? And I said, oh, da-da, and they want to do the play, but they don't have the money. And he said, Bob, God is saying to you, God is sending this opportunity, you've got to do this. And I said, well, I suppose I could maybe write to some friends and whatever. So to make the long story short, I sort of got in gear mm -hmm. and I helped them raise the money. I mean, it's kind of hard for me to believe after all these years mm -hmm. that a week from today, this play is going to be opening for previews at 59 East 59th Street. Yes, and when this show airs, it'll be up and running. It'll be on, moved to Broadway. Oh, okay. right. <laughs> Tony nominee, Bob Galele for Honest. Oh, well, no, 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 off-Broadway. God, God should hear you that it would be a Tony nominee.
I wanted to ask you, hey, do you have a Madoff play in you? You had the experience with Bernie Madoff. Is there something oh, that's going I to come you, from the ether was, there that you want to write about? Well, I don't know. I don't think so. It was really a startling experience. I was... I had run the HP Playwrights Theatre for Uda until she died, yeah. and then after a while it just wasn't so much fun anymore, and I had enough money, I wasn't rich rich, but I had enough money that I could live my life sort of okay, yeah. and I could thought, okay, you want to write? Write, Kaleli, just write. And so for three or four years I was home writing, and I had a routine, I would get up in the morning, make a protein tea, get the New York Times, go to the gym, work, work out at the gym, come home, write, and then get on with my day. Write for a few hours and get on with my day. And on Friday, Friday, December 12th, it I think it was, Friday. of 2008, I turned on the radio in the kitchen, and the first words out of the box were, and Bernard Madoff was arrested last night. <gasps> I cannot tell you the impact those words had on me, because 95, 96, 97% of my life savings were with Mr. Madoff. How did you wind up going with him? How did you meet him? Well, I have some wonderful, dear, fantastic, very rich friends mm -hmm. who when I was putting my life back together at one point, said, we have a wonderful investment guy. Let us... So I didn't have none money way back when. Bernie Madoff wouldn't take me. <laughs> and these people opened a joint account with me so I would have enough money. And then suddenly, a few years later, when I had enough money for my own account, we separated the accounts and I suddenly had my own. And I would sit home every month and get these big envelopes, Bernard Madoff LLC, and I'd open it. And I would look at this money. I'm rich. <laughs> and I was thinking, And you me. never suspected these returns are unreal? And neither did they. Uh -huh. Nobody did. And they were billionaires. Nobody did. Did you ever meet him? Did you ever spend any time with never, him? Never, ever met him. Never laid eyes on him. Oh, a funny, wonderful experience. I mean, that day, I thought, what are you going to do? I mean, I was just in a panic. Thought, okay, live in the moment. Just stay. Go to the gym. <laughs> find out what's going on. And I did that. Mm -hmm. And I went down in the elevator and lived on the seventh floor of this building. The little guy that works at the desk for 30 years, I watched him grow up and go to college. He's still there. He'd put the mail in the boxes every day. Oh, and he saw the... And he saw these big envelopes. He said, Bob, that, that Bernard Madoff LLC, those envelopes you get, is that the, the, the... And he pointed to the newspaper on the desk, and I said, yes, buddy, that's it. And he said, did he... Uh, did he... Uh, did he... And then he realized he was going too far. <laughs> and I said, yes, buddy, he got everything. And I went on to the gym. Oh, my God. So the next day I'm coming in, still in a state of shock, and I haven't a clue what I'm going to do with my life. I mean, I knew nothing at that point. And you just, I can't even tell you what I was thinking. I just don't know. And I was trying not to panic and just stay in the moment. I came in. I did know, as I walked in the front of my building and Buddy was sitting there at the desk, that I didn't want to talk to anybody, least of all him. So I just head for the elevator, and Buddy gets up, and he comes over, and he said, Bob, he said, I'm, how are you? I said, I was so worried last night, I couldn't sleep. My wife was worried about you. And I met his wife. <laughs> he said, my wife was worried about you. He said, I just couldn't sleep. Oh, he said, are you okay? And I said, yes. Now, by this time, I'm in the elevator, and I just want him to go away. But I'm smiling and saying, thank you, and thank you. And he, started, he finally started to let the door close. And he pulled it open. He said, Bob, I've got some aspirin or some Advil at the desk, if that will help. And I said, oh, buddy, thank you. That is so sweet. But I've got arsenic upstairs. <laughs> oh, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't get it. But as I was going up the elevator, I realized, and I laughed at my own joke, mm -hmm. and I knew that he got my money, but he didn't get my sense of humor, he didn't get my creativity, he didn't get my friends, he didn't get my love of life. He just got some stuff. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know what I was going to do, but I suddenly remembered, looking out my kitchen window, that when I was a kid, 20 years old, arriving from Wyoming, without a clue what I was going to do in New York City, thinking one night, I just have to find a place to sleep tonight, and then I'll figure out what to do. And I realized that 50 years later, that's what I had to do. I just had to start over. Hmm. And unbelievable things fell out of the trees. You know, I just, I'm sort of a leader of the universe. If you're going where you're supposed to be going and taking the steps you're supposed to be doing, the universe will kind of move in behind you and move you along in that path. And since, 19, since 2008, I cannot even tell you the things that have happened that have been so extraordinary in my life that have just kept me going. And then now, at the age of 74, really? it's hard to say You're that. 74. At the age of 74, Don't to have it. a play produced for the first time. Because, you know, I've produced 40 or 50 plays yeah. and musicals on tour and all around and worked with some really wonderful people all of my life. But to have a play produced... Your own play. My own play. Well, I give you an A-plus for that uh, Bernie Madoff story. There's, that's a play that just... 
it that is, could be good. <laughs> it, it is quite a story, I must say. And yeah. it's, you know, it goes you, on. You, can, you can reflect happily on it now that everything's worked out. Yes, it's true. Yeah, it's but true. as he said, though, he, you know, there's the, the, the kick in the gut, and then you think, mm -hmm. life goes on. Oh, and friends kept calling me right after that. And this one friend of mine, Sterling Zinsmeyer, called me and he said, are you okay, Bob? Are you okay? And I was just so sick of people saying, I said, yes, Sterling, you don't have to worry. I'm not going to jump out the window. If I'm going to kill myself over this, I'm going to get on the plane and fly to Paris and jump in front of the Orient Express. <laughs> so unless you've heard I've gone to Paris, you don't have to worry. <laughs> and Sterling said, oh, Bob, now if you're going to do that, at least zip yourself up in a body bag so you don't bloody that beautiful train. <laughs> <laughs> so at least we can all laugh, laugh about it. Laugh the whole thing. All right, the play is On a Stool at the End of the Bar by Bob Kaleli. Robert Kaleli, is that your official playwriting title? That's my official playwriting title. Directed by Michael Parva, and it is running until December 14th at uh, 59 East 59th Street, which happens to be one of my favorite theaters here in town. Thank you so much. Thanks for being our guest. Thank you for having Thank me here you. today. Thanks. This is confession. You can't talk about this to anybody. No one. You understand? No. I don't know what to do, but you got no right to say a single word to anybody. About me, about the kids, nothing. I'm going to be talking. Confession. Our thanks to the Friends of Theatre Talk for their significant contribution to this production. Theatre Talk is made possible in part by the Frederick Lowe Foundation, the Corey and Bob Dinelli Charitable Fund, the Noel Coward Foundation, Carrie J. Freeze, the Dorothy Strelson Foundation, plus public funds from the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs, the New York State Council on the Arts, a state agency, and the Theater Development Fund's Technical Accessibility Program, which helps provide closed captioning. Welcome your questions or comments for Theatre Talk. Thank you and good night.